Hello Booktube. I have a mail haul for you, but it's a tiny one. It's just two books. They were actually carried by hand by the mailman, Laszlo the mailman. And Tom from Tipperary, the mail truck driver, I saw him whiz right by the house. Not so much as a glance in my direction. So I thought, uh, rather than just open those two packages and complain about it the whole time, we could open all my mail together. <laughs> If I'm, if I'm booked to his crazy old senior citizen anyway, I might as well do that. <laughs> so the first thing is the new New York Review of Books, which is, if you're a reader or a book reviewer, a cause of pure joy <laughs> to find this in your mailbox. So I always uh, go through the table of contents just to see who's doing what, and especially uh, are any books being reviewed that I've read or even that I've reviewed. Uh, so we have... Uh, I see... Look at this. The, th the thing about the New York Review is the, is the lineup, the names you get, is just incredible. Fintan O'Toole, Julia Preston, James Fenton, John Banville, Charles Glass, Daryl Pinkney, Adam Thurwell, Gordon Wood. All in the same issue. These are these people are all in the same issue. It's incredible. Uh, Michael Gore, Michael Wood, Tim Judah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let's, let's see what they write about. So we've got... Uh, uh, Julia Preston writes about two books about uh, immigration. Fintan O'Toole reviews By Women Possessed, a, a new biography of Eugene O'Neill that I didn't like at all. Not at all. Uh, I, I, maybe he'll find something more in it than I did. Uh, James Fenton reviews a bunch of collections of uh, artwork about World War I and America, one of the which we saw, that, that, that oversized thing we saw, America in the First World War. Uh, oh, John Banville reviews Colin Thubron's Night of Fire, which is a, a novel entirely about the lives of people who are who are caught in a house fire. Uh, and it's a there's a lot going on in that novel. It's it's uh, it's subtle, and you can't say that about too many novels that come out in the Western market these days. And that's good because John Banville is an extremely subtle author on his own. So that's a perfect match right there. Uh, Charlie Glass writes about Aleppo. Tim Judah writes about Ukraine. That That's uh, non-book related, but that's political writing of the first order. You'll want to read both of those. Uh, somebody named Robert Paxton reviews two books on owls, two, book, two new books on owls, uh, including Owls, A Guide to Every Species in the World by Marianne Taylor, which was great. <laughs> uh, Daryl Pingney writes a new book about, uh, a new book about uh, race relations. Uh, Gordon Wood reviews in George Washington's Journey by T. H. Breen. It was it was drum banging hagiography, so we'll hope that he has a tendency to like that sort of thing. I'm hoping he doesn't. Uh, oh, okay. Now someone I that I don't know at all. Uh, Priyamvada Natarajan uh, does a review of pioneering women in the sciences, and one of the books is The Glass Universe by Davis Sobel, which was great, absolutely great. I reviewed it. For the Christian Science Monitor, it was one of those books where I wished I had three times the length to, to just praise it more and more, just go on and on. But I'm really kind of hoping that that Christian Science Monitor review is blurbed on the paperback. <laughs> we shall see. You will certainly hear about it. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael Gore, oh great! Michael Gore writes a review of a new collection of four little novels that, that Edith Wharton wrote during the 1920s, including A Son at the Front, that I think is better than people think. And he's great on her and Henry James. He's, he's the, again, the perfect person to, to write about. Just the person you want to talk to. Uh, oh, Michael Wood writes about um, Bresson, so that's, that's a bit of a waste. For me, I don't care about cinematography. I don't care about uh, snooty French directors, so I, I won't. I will read the piece, of course, because you don't miss Michael Wood, but I won't. Uh, I won't do it over it. <laughs> and I don't think, the, if I remember correctly, there are no enormous controversies going on in the letters pages. Uh, no, no, no uh, angry retorts, no nothing like that. All right, so that's the New York Review of Books. That's fantastic. So I go nowhere on Sunday, and Monday I go to the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, so I will read this on Tuesday. I will hold myself up in my tiny little Chinese food restaurant and read that with no white people around, <laughs> no English around. No need for anything. Been ordering the exact same thing 
for 35 years. So I just walk in, I sit down, that's all there is to it. And I get to concentrate completely on periodicals. Uh, but the next two things are not books, they are catalogs. Uh, so let's see. The first one is from the University of Nebraska. University of Nebraska Press. I've noticed that uh, the Western and Midwestern presses, University of Nebraska or Minnesota or Michigan or whatnot, uh, they're, they have endowments, and so they are obliged to do local history. A large chunk of their list for any catalog will be local history, so nothing that, that I'm going to, realistically, that I'm going to read or pitch. Uh, but I've noticed that, that uh, they will also usually have one or two general interest things, and sometimes they're well worth getting. Uh, so that's that's their catalog right there. Uh, and what have we got here? So the uh, you see, so the there's a new history of the Modoc War. That's two. It's great reading, and it's a great it's a it's a well a welcome thing to have a whole book on it. But it's nothing. It's too local. Uh, mm, now, okay, now this next one, the Great Plains Bison, uh, a history and a biology. <clears throat> that's much more promising. Oh, but it's only 150 pages. It's only 150 pages long. You could 150 pages isn't enough space to write about the digestive system of the American bison. It, it isn't, it isn't in enough space to write about even one of the native of native cultures that depended on the animal completely for everything. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what we'll do with that. Uh, uh, the memoir of a uh, serviceman in Afghanistan. <clears throat> oh, oh, there's a oh great. Uh, there's a, a book by uh, Harriet Lee Elam Thomas uh, called "Diversifying Diplomacy," and the subtitle is "My Journey from Roxbury to Dakar: The Extraordinary Diplomatic Career of the Little Elam Girl from Boston." Now that is something uh, I don't think I could interest anybody in uh, in reviewing it, but I very much want to review it myself. I, that's one of the nice things about uh, about Open Letters Monthly is that I can just review this. I'm not I'm not totally at the mercy of other editors. I can just this is this is a worthwhile thing. That's a worthwhile thing to re to uh, request. Uh, the NFL, more NFL, more NFL. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is again Nebraska. Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, oh my! Oh no! <laughs> it's a biography of Tom Yawkey, the patriarch of the Boston Red Sox. I believe it's his first one. Isn't this his first one? Oh wow! Oh, and it's six hundred pages long. Oh, well, I have to get that. Okay, great. Oh my God! Tom Yawkey gets a, bi a biography. That is something. <laughs> That's going to be a tough job to pull off. <laughs> uh, and then we get to, uh, you know, an Atlas of Nebraska, all sorts of regional stuff uh, that isn't isn't quite. That's what I was talking about, where where you get uh, you get stuff that's meant for uh, a local audience, and that isn't isn't so much going to be of interest to to me. I, I'm not really sure. I think that's a I think that's a bad ha holdover uh, from the days when the, the, when Nebraska or anywhere else had a vital uh, original press that would cover these things. I, I don't know that they do anymore. Uh, Glenn Miller at War, and then uh, hmm, and then uh, homesteading on the plains, that sort of thing. Qu uh, quilts from the plains. Uh, so, so much, the back half goes on to what you'd expect, but there are a couple of things there that I've just got to have. That's great. Uh, and then the next one is Pegasus books. Now they're, they're not regional, of course, so there's bound to be a lot more in here. Uh, let's see, let's see what this has to do. Ah, there we go. I've actually been through this. I got, uh, this is not, this is not the first, my first copy of this catalog. I seem to remember that they don't do request forms anymore. No, no, you just have to email. So, a uh, big new biography of Marlene Dietrich, The Last of the Czars. We saw that already. Uh, uh, some fiction. 
uh, marked for death. We saw that already too. Air, air combat during the First World War. More fiction. Uh, new biography of Mozart that is 288 pages long. I don't get it. I don't understand that. Uh, uh, what can you do in 280? I don't know what you can do in 288 pages. Uh, maybe you can. Uh, maybe I'm selling the benefits of brevity short. Uh, new history of the skull and bones. Uh, oh, look at that. Clockwork Futures, uh, which is subtitled The Science of Steampunk and the Reinvention of the Modern World. That could be interesting. Uh, Oh, wow. Oh, look at that. A collection. Revolution, 1917. A collection of writings from the Russian Revolution. Uh, great. Fantastic. Uh, then, uh, let's see here. More Crusades. Bunch of, they, they mix in their paperback reprints with their new releases in hardcover. That's, that's kind of an interesting thing. There's a new book about uh, Einstein's 1915 theory of general relativity. That's, uh, that's going to be a tough sell. Uh, Oh, look at that. Oh, look at this one. For the Winner, a new, a new novel about Jason and the Argonauts by Emily Hauser, who studied classics at Cambridge, where she was taught by Mary Beard. Uh, wow. Okay. Oh, then we've got uh, uh, Colonial Horrors. Can you see that? Look at that. That's Headless Horseman. Uh, Sleepy Hollow and Beyond is uh, the most spine-tingling suspense stories from the colonial era, including Washington Irving, Nathaniel Hawthorne, James Fenimore Cooper, Edgar Allan Poe, Henry James, and H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> okay. All right, so, so that's a bit of a misspeak right there. It's not stories from the colonial era. It's Stoney's stories set in the colonial era. <laughs> it's Edgar Allan Poe. And Henry James and H. B. Lovecraft. <laughs> I think you're probably no. All right. So this is this is story set in the colonial era. <laughs> okay, it's, had me off for a minute there. Oh my! Oh, look at that! So great a prince. The accession of Henry the Eighth to the throne. Oh my! Well, I will certainly be doing that, because I am, at Open Letters Monthly, I am doing uh, A Year with Tutors 2, uh, and that's 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 the fall, that's October, that's right up my alley, fantastic. Uh, Space Traveler's Guide to the Solar System is not in paperback, a bunch of murder mysteries, more murder mysteries, oh, A History of Rome, The Eternal City, A History of Rome. By Ferdinand Addis. 500 pages. He's been fascinated by, with Rome since reading Livy as a teenager. <laughs> he studied classics at Oxford. Hmm, very nice. Uh, lots of Sherlock Holmes. Lots and lots of that. That's good. Uh, oh, the paperback of Millennium by Ian Mortimer. Hmm. Hmm. Uh oh. With a very nice blurb from the Christian Science Monitor. <laughs> okay, great. All right, this is a great catalog. That's fantastic. Oh my. Oh goodness gracious. Oh, <laughs> Wendy Jones strikes again. Jane on the brain. <laughs> the subtitled "Exploring the Science of Social Intelligence with Jane Austen." <laughs> oh my. <laughs> You know, the paperback of Crown of Blood by about Jane Grey. Uh, oh, wow, look at that. This is this hardcover? Yes, it is. Look at that. Let me see if I can show it to you. Coming to the Fire is the name of it. The subtitle is The Unnatural History of Dogs, Cats, Cows, and Horses. Interesting. Coming to the Fire. That's, this is going to be about domestication. I have found that most of the books that I read about domestication get it wrong. They just plain get it wrong. They get wrong what, what actually happened. Uh, so uh, I'll just have to wait and see <laughs> what happens. Oh, I'm looking at another ancient Rome book. This one's by Bijan Omrani, who attended Lincoln College, Oxford. He's the author and editor of various works on Central Asia. Uh, he teaches class classics at Westminster School in England, and this is called Caesar's Footprints. 
uh, a cultural excursion to ancient France journeys through Roman Gaul. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Great. I was kind of hoping that this catalog would have the paperback of, uh, of the Red Sphinx, that Alexander Dumas book that I loved so much, but maybe I'm too early. Maybe that'll be the spring. Okay, so that is our that is our second catalog, Pegasus Books. Uh, and then we have the two books, uh, and then I will stop. <laughs> so, uh, let's see what this first one is. It's from Havid, and it's called Kin by John Ingraham. How we came to know our microbe relatives. Kin. There's a bunch of the critters swimming right there in a Petri dish. Interesting. All right, so since Darwin, people have speculated about the evolutionary relationships among dissimilar species, including our connections to the diverse life forms known as microbes. In the 1970s, biologists discovered a way to establish these kinships. This new era of exploration began with Linus Pauling's finding that every protein in every cell contains a huge reservoir of evolutionary history. His discovery opened a research path that has changed the way biologists and other things and others think about the living world. In Kin, the author tells the story of these remarkable breakthroughs. His original accessible history explores how we came to understand our microbe inheritance and the relatedness of all organisms on Earth. Among the most revolutionary scientific achievements was Carl Voice's discovery that a large group of organisms previously lumped together with bacteria were in fact totally distinct form of life, now called archaea. Uh, with the, but the crowning accomplishment has been to construct the Tree of Life, an evolutionary project Darwin dreamed about over a century ago. Today we know that the tree's three main stems are dominated by microbes. The non-microbes, plants and animals, including humans, constitute only a small upper branch in one stem. How's that for humbling? Uh, so this will go into the uh, something that I've mentioned on this channel before. This is due in uh, in late April. It's not actually getting to me very early. Uh, but this this will will delve into the uh, the genetic, the cellular uh, stuff that humans have in common with all other things. Uh, which is fascinating, <laughs> absolutely fascinating. Uh, I I, uh, I can't help, I can't hear it without thinking about uh, some of our outspoken atheists that I know, the ones who aren't just outspoken atheists, but also outspoken anti-Christians, uh, who there are a couple I know who actually started, got their, their uh, little baby steps started on the debate circuit uh, in the footsteps, of course, of Christopher Hitchens, who they all worship. Uh, and they will jump on a book like this because of course biological genetic interrelatedness between things as different as bacterium and celery and sparrows and humans is almost completely fatal to a literal reading of instantaneous biological creation of life why on earth would that be true why on earth would an all-powerful creator not make celery entirely of celery <laughs> why why would a bacterium that can kill a human have you know 50 percent genetic inheritance that's the same as humans why would it have any genetic inheritance the same at all why would there be bacteria much less as this as that summary made clear most life on earth being bacteria and also uh, i'm sure the book will point out what a uh, detail you've probably heard already which is that most of you is bacteria a totally impartial alien life scan of your body would say that you were the host, or that you were the parasite, and, and that there was a large colony, that you are a walking large colony of bacteria and that and microbes of all kinds, and that an accidental byproduct of that large colony was intelligence, your personality, everything you think runs the show. <laughs> an Im a totally impartial alien biologist would say well no that this is just a, a, a large community of bacteria that happens to have developed side effects just like a large community of a city will will as a side effect develop a dump that attracts bears <laughs> and the fallacy of the human viewpoint of the world would be as if the bears were saying that the city was there for them 
Uh, but <laughs> but those those friends of mine who are starting uh, their little footsteps on the anti-Christian debate circuit are idiots anyway. So so what difference does it make what they make of the book? They'll cherry pick it, which is one of the things they hate about uh, creationists who always cherry pick. Uh, they don't ever read the source material that they're that they're mocking. They pick one line here or there. <laughs> My, my uh, friends on the debate circuit never realize that they're doing the same thing, or they realize it and don't care. Uh, but one way or another, it's a... Well, we'll get to it in great length when we do our read-along of God is not great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, here's the, the last thing I'll bother you with today. This is the day's second book. Uh, and this is an advance copy for uh, September called The Disappearance of Emil Zola by Michael Rosen, uh, who is a poet, a broadcaster, and former children's laureate, and a recipient of one of France's top honors. His children's book, We're Going on a Bear Hunt, has sold over 8 million copies. Oh my god, he wrote uh, We're Going on a Bear Hunt. I, I have a copy of that book. Michael Rosen, why did I not know his name? Uh, the incredible story of Emile Zola's escape to London in the aftermath of the scandalous Dreyfus Affair. It is the evening of July 18, 1898, and the world-renowned novelist Emile Zola is on the run. His crime? Taking on the highest powers in the land with his open letter, Jacques Hughes, and, uh, and losing. Forced to leave Paris with nothing but the clothes he's standing in and a nightshirt wrapped in a newspaper, Zola flees to England with no idea what will, when he will return. This is a little-known story of Zola's time in exile. Rosen has traced Zola's footsteps, uh, from the Gare du Nord to, to London, examining the significance of this year. Huh. Okay, the disappearance of Emil Zola. So, so uh, this comes out in the mid-September. Uh, in hardcover, I bet this get reviews everywhere. This will get reviewed everywhere, and, it, un, and unfortunately, it won't have anything to do with uh, with all the work that Michael Rosen has put into this book. It won't have anything to do with retracing Zola's footsteps in exile, uh, which is what the whole book is about. Instead, everybody will take a whack at this in order to wheeze on about the Dreyfus Affair. Uh, wow, okay. I will not be writing about it, I don't think. Uh, but uh, I certainly won't be writing about it for pay. Uh, all right, so anyway, there we go. That is the uh, the disappearance of Emil Zola. I don't have to hold it sideways, do I? There's only two. And Kin. A book about bacteria and what they, uh, the microbes, and what they have in common with you, and what you have in common with them. And then we have uh, two catalogs to add to my pile, and a pile of these, that's great, uh, and the New York Review books. Uh, so that is, you, we, we open Grandpa's mail. <laughs> and that's, that's it for now, so I will see you soon, BookTube, hopefully with more interesting fare. <laughs> so, oh, goodbye.